Hello, this is Dr. Dan Guerra coming to you from the Inland Pacific Northwest, and these are the Lush and Lavish Authentic Biochemistry Video Studios. Today I'm going to come and talk to you about mevalonate metabolism perambulating the T lymphocyte response. Now, a quick understanding of the word perambulate, because the rest I think are rather self-evident. Perambulate, I think, the way that I look at the word, is kind of like walking with someone or walking around with someone looking at the expanse or the, um, the horizon and understanding the boundaries and the matrices of what it is we're going to speak about or look at or respond to. So I'm going to tell you eventually with this series of lectures that mevalonic acid metabolism actually helps direct via placement of certain signaling systems the T cell response in the acquired immune system. Okay, So it's a very bold statement to make right now because I know there are a lot of regulations of T lymphocytes that we've talked about in the past. In fact, I'm going to reflect on those via video recollection so that we go back and, take a, and, and make sure we're at, on the same page. Okay, so let's get started. All right, so that's me, Dr. Dan Guerra, and this is indeed Authentic Biochemistry. We already said that. Today is the 10th of August, 2020, and I'm doing this because I have nothing better to do, which means this is a great thing to do. All right. First of all, from a paper published in 2009 in Journal Immunity, you can see the citation there. Um, I want to make sure we're on the same page with an understanding of the basics of T cells. So you start up with it, there are CD8 positive and CD4 positive T cells, and we'll get into that later. But for a naive CD4 positive T cell, when it is exposed to a cytokine called interleukin-21, it can be converted into or transform into a T follicular helper cell. That's what the TFH stands for. Now that is its own function, and we're going to talk about it later. What I'm talking about here is just the lineage. Now that same naive CD4 positive T cell, if it's, ex if it's exposed to interferon gamma and the co-stimulatory interleukin-12, it will become a Th1 lymphocyte. These are main important T lymphocytes for the acquired immune system to control infection and thus generate an inflammatory response. One of the transcription factors TH1 uh, lymphocytes use is the TBET system. We'll talk about it later. If you take the naive cell and expose it to interleukin-4, that cytokine, you're going to get TH2 lineage. That's going to be dominated by a transcription factor called GATA3. Now, it can further differentiate into a cell lineage, which is still not well characterized in the presence of TGF-beta, which is another plantar cytokine, to a TH9 motif. Now, the TH9 motif is actually just a different subset of TH2. Naive T cell ex exposed to interleukin 6 and TGF-beta will become a TH17 lineage with its own necessary components and control over certain infections, which I will get to. Its main transcription vector is Roar Gamma T. Remember that is a retinoic acid orphan receptor system. It's going to use retinoic acid as one of its components as a ligand to turn on the transcription of the genes in the TH17 lineage. Now look here. If you expose an naive T a CD4 cell, to TGF-beta, retinoic acid, and leukin 2 you can get an inducible T regulatory cell, which uses its, its main transcription factor, FOXP3. Now, T reg is going to suppress all those other effector cells, TH1, TH2, TH17. Okay? However, T reg can be converted to a TH17 cell, and a TH17 cell can be converted to TH1. Not in every cell situation, and not in every induction, but it has been shown to be able to make these conversions. So going from a T-reg, which is a suppressor cell, 
to a TH17, which is a defective cell, and then over to a TH1, which is another very potent defective cell, shows you that T regulatory cells do not have one family tree. When exposed to the right environment of cytokines, and look at 6, you'll look at 21 for the TH17 conversion, and then onward, you know, look at 12 for the TH1 conversion. You can see a T regulatory cell, even if it's found as a T regulatory cell, say via those cytometry, in the right microenvironment, it can actually turn into an effector cell. Therefore, what that means is an advanced form of inflammatory response, because right? that's what these TH1, TH2, TH17 cells are going to do. They're going to really push for the inflammatory response by synthesizing pro inflammatory cytokines. T suppressor cells are going to try to tamp that down. T suppressor cells are going to be for T reg. However, T reg can be converted. That's the important take home message from this first slide. Now, here's something really also very fascinating. T reg cells, depending on how their transcription factor is modified, and so FOXP3 is the main T reg transcription factor, but they can also use raw gamma T and TBAT and GATA3. But depending on their alteration of histone 3, either at lysine 27 or lysine 4, that's what those two markers are there, the crimson one and then the kind of lime colored one, right? Those are histones associated with chromatin epigenetically modified with a methyl group. Okay, So it's either going to be on lysine 27 of histone 3 or lysine 4 of histone 3 and the methylation on those two systems showing you that altering the epigenetic signature will then alter which transcription factors are going to be turned on so that the cell becomes a florid utilizer of that transcription factor. Obviously, you can see how Tregs can be converted to a Th1 or a Th17 or a Th2 because I just told you that the main transcription factors for those other three subsets are just the following. TBAT for the TH1. So if you a TBAT is stopped for, from expression, you see, because it has this methylation pattern on that lysine 27, you won't get any TBAT. But if those if those epigenetic phenomena aren't occurring, then you can get TBAT because TBAT is going to cause a TH1 lineage. And notice TBAT has no methylation. So a demethylation will allow for the T reg, all things can be considered for the other transcription factor expressions to be converted to TH1. Likewise, notice how TH17, how you can get a T reg into a TH17 and back again to a T reg. Now, that's the only one that will change from one back to the other, T reg TH17. That's because the raw gamma T is under the control of FOXP3. See? So if FOXP3 is made, the T reg shuts off that lineage. But if the FOXP3 is shut down because there's no methylation of that histone, automatically raw gamma T will become the transcription factor utilized, and that cell will transform into expressing all the genes under that transcription factor lineage. You see? TH2, you can see the GATA3 having no methylation is going to be the dominant. So the way it works is then there's no methylation, obviously. That transcription factor that is initially going to be transcribed and then become a transcription factor for all subsequent transcription of either pro inflammatory or, or non inflammatory cytokines, as well as chemokines, as well as growth factors, uh, and another whole host of transcription factors, that's going to be regulated by the methylation pattern. That's an epigenetic phenomenon. He's telling you there's part two of a regulatory property of T cells. Now, paper published way back in 2002, that's 18 years ago and counting. Some of you may never have not even been born yet. It's amazing for me to think about it. I was certainly born then. I was a little bit older than that. Boy. In fact, I was already a professor teaching this sort of material in lecture hall. Now, watch what, what the paper tells us. So I'll go back to these earlier papers because they tell us something foundational that is necessary for the rest of the material to be complete. Coherent. And remember, necessary, coherent, foundational, those are aspects of what we can use as a true premise.
for generating an argument for understanding, ultimately, after a synthesis of what T cells can tell us about the acquired immune response, of course, using just very plain old categorical logic. So what does the paper found say? The activation of T cells requires two separate receptors. The antigen-specific T-cell receptor, which is the result of recombination mechanisms, it binds to a foreign peptide antigen major histocompatibility complex, an MHC complex. Soon we'll talk about which ones, which one in predominant. And there's another receptor that is necessary for T-cell activation. It's a CD28, and it binds to a cluster called the B7. More on this later, but it has two other names, CD80 and CD86. Uh, we will we will talk about this in more detail. I'm not going to bring it up now. Those are co-stimulatory molecules, and they're expressed on the surface of the antigen-presenting cell we call APCs. APCs are things like macrophages, uh, dendritic cells. Now, the simultaneous triggering of these T cell surface receptors with their ligands will result in full-blown fluorid T-cell activation. However, there is already a regulatory component. The CDLA4 system, which is another receptor on the surface of T-cells, also known as CD152, is a distinct T-cell receptor that upon binding to those same B7 molecules will inhibit the signal to T-cell activation. So already you can turn down the pathway. Now, we get to talk about MHC. Two classes of MHC, they come from the HLA gene lineage in humans. So the class one molecule has this kind of bind, bind, peptide binding cleft. That peptide is going to be what is presented in this discussion to the T cell. That's where the peptide is com comes from a fragmented fragmentation of, let's say, some larger foreign antigen or from an endogenous protein that is going to be presented as an antigen to cause T cells to recognize that something's wrong with the cell lineage and go after it with an acquired immune response. Ultimately, it's, we'll, we'll get into all that later. So you have a membrane distal domain, a membrane proximal domain. You can see there's a beta-2 microglobulin associated with this. They all have self and bonds here. Uh, and that, and that's, that's held as tethered into the membrane segment the transmembrane segment itself with the alpha helical type of uh, uh, secondary structure. Now, MH2 class molecules, the peptide binding cleft is unique and different. You see it's more expansive, okay? So that's the different form of the MHC, it's MHC2. It has a beta 1 and a beta 2, but you can see that this becomes a heterotetramer, right? Actually, there's, two, there's a dimer here and a dimer here. Here, this is a trimer of beta-2, a uh, uh, beta-2 by itself, and then it's just a monomer of beta-2 microglobulin. So that works. Okay. So they're distinct at the level of polypeptide structure, and um, the quaternary structure of the polypeptides come together at the membrane surface. I'm touching the wrong button. I'm touching All right. So here's more details of MHC1 and MHC2. One, MHC class one, is present on almost all nucleated cells, <clears throat> including platelets. Proteins are encoded by the HLA, B, and A, and C genes. Antigens presented by class one are of an endogenous origin. Remember before I told you if we have a cell that's uh, corrupted, maybe it's been transformed by a virus, and the virus is starting to set up shop and produce a lot of virion in that cell. Well, the virion can be degraded by proteases after an endosomal degradation pathway, endosomal lysosomal degradation pathway. And fragments of that peptide can be expressed on the surface of those cells. How they express on the surface of those cells? On the MHC class 1. Now, those peptides are endogenous. doesn't mean that the protein necessarily was of an endogenous or origin, only that it was synthesized within the cell. So, but you do have a lot of cytosolic proteins that get put on MHC class 1. Now, part of that is to prime the normal homeostatic 
friend and foe interaction of all the cells in the body with T lymphocytes after being after the MHC1 is associated with peptide and it's triggering the T cell receptor as well as the other receptor. However, however, this is very important. If the cytosolic protein is made in a huge abundance in a native host cell, then those cells are also somehow corrupted. For example, they could be tumor cells. Or they could just be cells where they've had a series of mutations that are necessarily oncogenic phenomena. But the mutations have led to the production of proteins that are over the abundance level that they should be. And the intracellular machinery recognizes the overabundance, not only of proteins, but maybe unfolded protein. We talked about the unfolded protein um, response, right? And the endoplasmic particular, which are like glycosylated proteins that become degraded. Those are the kind of proteins that could be run up on the surface of those cells and, and loaded onto the MHC class one. Uh, there are also the products of uh, cytosolic proteasome, that means ubiquitin procedures going on. I told you the ER, ER transporter, peptide loading complexes, and recognition, recognizing co-receptors. You can see that there's a lot of interaction with that MFC class one with the peptide itself. It's a sorting mechanism. Now, contrast that to MHC2. These are more the frank peptide receptor present, presenting systems when you're dealing with antigen presenting cells. These have a restricted tissue distribution. They're chiefly found on macrophages, dendritic cells, B cells, or plasma cells, and other antigen presenting cells, okay, like, like um, oh, maybe acinophils. Acinophils can also present the antigen. MHC class two proteins are encoded by the genes of the HLA-D region. Right? That's only one of the HLA genes, just the D gene. The other one has all three, maybe C. Antigens presented by class two are derived from extracellular proteins. Now, this includes this includes bacteria, and this includes virus, and this includes fungal, this includes parasitic proteins that are bound up on these uh, digesting cells, right, of macrophages and dendritic cells. They can digest some of that foreign antigen and present their peptide fragments on the surface of their MHC class two moieties and target that to the T cell lineage, okay? Class two molecules sample peptides outside the cell, you see, such as lysosomal proteins, mostly internalized from extracellular environment. So you can get an internalization of extracellular matrix um, fragments, and then they can be internalized and shot back up through the MHC class but ultimately they can affect the cellular environment. These could be things like bacterial cells, fungal cells, uh, virions, right? Or they could just be um, high concentrations of serum proteins that aren't supposed to be there. Foreign antigens, usually, but even sometimes proteins that have been um, secreted from cells because there's damage to an organ, like the liver, the kidney, the heart, the brain. Right? So it's a very beautiful, elegant system of MHC class too, I think. Um, you can get endosomal and lysosomal proteases functioning here, specialized vesicular compartments. The endosomal vesicular systems are, are operating here. Chaperones in the ER and variant chains in the ER. This is all part of the ER stress response. The Golgi, MAC class two compartments, and then the vesicle generated from the cis-trans Golgi apparatus. They're recognized by CD4 co-receptors to a B1 and B2 subunit with which is cell. Again, it's just background for T cells, okay? So a little bit more. MHC class one also presents antigens to CD8 T cells, whereas MHC class two presents to the CD4 positive lineage, like the ones we were just talking about. Remember the naive CD4 lineage? Now you can have double positive T cells, CD4 positive, CD8 positive, those are also frank and well-justified T cell lineages, with no problem. MHC class one molecules consist of one membrane spanning and producing MHC genes and one beta chain produced by the beta microglobulin. We saw that. MHC two consists of two membrane spanning chains, but the alpha and beta, you saw that. 
uh, the, the building amino acids, about eight to 10 for the uh, uh, MHC1, and a little bit longer amino acid fragments for the MHC2. What else do I want to say? Um, MHC class one has no invariant chain, whereas the MHC class two has an invariant chain. So that differentiates then the actual receptor with its binding to the antigen, whether or not that chain is invariant, because that regulates then how much recombination mechanism went into the ultimate utilization of that system. All right. So for MHC class one, presence of abundant antigens targets also destruction. And for MHC class two, the presence of foreign antigens induce an antibody production. So you're triggering the T cells, and the T cells are going to trigger to the B cells. They're going to become antibody producing, immunoglobulin producing plasma cells way downstream. Okay, so you've got you've got innate immune cells expressing MHC uh, C class two peptides, triggering the T cell response and then turning on the B cell response, making immunoglobulins like IgG, uh, also known as antibodies. Okay. All right, and yeah, the way you detect is a little bit more elaborate with um, the MHC class two, but the full cytometry to pick all these up. All right, now. Here we're talking about native Treg cells, and we're looking at the B7 and a leukin 2 turning on the FOXP3. In the presence of strong B7, I'm going to get into what B7 is in a moment, you get a native Treg system that's expressing faithful the FOXP3 transcription vector and making a lot of interleukin 10, which is an anti inflammatory cytokine. Now, let me move my Okay, so a T naive cell, one that isn't now a T reg cell, in the presence of um, TGF beta and leukin 2, which we looked at just three slides ago, is going to give you an inducible T reg cell. Those are good T suppressor cells. They're going to express just, you know, Fox B3 just fine. In the presence of a strong B7 interaction, remember, that's the, that's the other ligand system. It's going to give you full blown IT regs expressing Fox B3 and making a lot of them with the good suppressor cell as well. Okay? Now, the distinction there is you can go right from the na naive to the inducible T regulatory cell. You can also make a T regulatory type 1 cell, which is Fox B3 and interleukin 10. Okay? But that requires interleukin 10 to generate that lineage. And finally, a strong B7 um, in, induction of the, T, of the T cell lineage, along with then looking 12 or 4 or 11, 6 and TGF beta, is going to give you a complex of TH1, TH2, and TH17, which is all going to turn into, in the presence of strong B cell stimu uh, B7 stimulation, it's a B cell there. Uh, and the presence of interleukin 10, way high, it's going to go back giving you a T regulatory like one cell. Okay. And that's going to again generate FOXP3 and interleukin 10. You get the idea here, right? Now, so that was a review of T lymphocytes at the level of. What is the induction phenomena? What are some of the transcription factors we think about when we get into different T cell lineages? All of that is prolegomena to what I really want to get to, and I'm going to start right now, which is T lymphocyte regulation by mevalonic acid metabolism, something we've been dealing with a long time now in the um, audio lectures from authentic biochemistry that we just covered last week. Remember, this is only the 10th of August, so this isn't like a long, delayed wait. Now, a lot of this work comes from a paper published back five years ago, five years and four months ago, um, in Science Signaling, an excellent journal, by the way. And this is volume eight, issue 370. So again, background information, but it's the kind of information you need to build the knowledge base, right? You don't have any of this information, not going to understand anything I'm going to be telling you. And you should try to remember what you can. K 
take notes. And of course, you can look at this video over and over again and stop it. Uh, a lot different than if this was a live lecture, unless you were taping. So here's some introduction, introductory remarks. Signaling through the T cell receptor that we just looked at briefly serves as a paradigm for how cell surface receptors translate extrinsic cues into cellular intrinsic responses. The metabolic regulation of T lymphocytes as a consequence of that stimulation is also of interest. So when I say metabolic regulation, that means what's going on inside the T cell, right? In terms of, for example, bioenergetics that can support an expression system like lymphoenteral cytokines, like the TH1, TH2, TH17 lineages. So it's increasingly appreciated the T cell activation results in metabolic reprogramming and indeed the distinct T cell functions depend on the activation of appropriate nested set or network of metabolic pathways. Perfectly in the realm of biochemistry. Now in contrast to resting cells, which pursue efficient accumulation of ATP, which you can think of what routes might make it an efficient uh, in synthesis of ATP. In contrast to that, activated T cells must ensure high metabolic flux through anabolic pathways to acquire a specific molecular repertoire. Why is that? Because once you activate the T cell, it's now fully armored and it wants to go and take care of whatever the immune uh, signatures are dictating. So the T cell is now activated. It has to switch its metabolism. For example, if it was coasting along on fatty acid oxidation for energy, there's nothing wrong with that. But T cells don't accumulate a lot of triacylglycerol. All right. So they're, so they're really taking up fatty acid from uh, the milieu. Now that's fine because you can get it from serum albumin. You can get it through the CD36 uh, orphan receptor pathway. A lot of ways that fatty acids can be brought into the cell. Uh, ultimately sent through mitochondria, beta oxidized, and a whole bit of ADH if a DH2 is made, uh, electron transport chain oxidized to make ATP. It's a slow process, slow and steady, perfect for say heartbeat. But when you want to activate cells, you're probably going to be switching to something like glucose and amino acids. That's exactly what I talked about last time, or two or two episodes ago, about glutaminolysis. We're going to get back to that right, right soon here, right soon, uh, right away actually. In contrast to resting cells, it must have been somewhere in my mind, I used to probably say right soon, I was corrected when I was three or something, obviously. I'm just recalling it. In contrast to resting cells, okay, which pursue that ATP uh, efficiency of beta oxidation, again, we're going to be switching to an alternative fuel. Uh, that's really important. I want you to remember that. Now, here's a lot of information that's written down for you, and I'm going to go through it. That's what I do. Stimulated T cells shift from oxidative phosphorylation to aerobic glycolysis. Now, remember, several lectures ago, I told you in some ways, T metabolism, T cell metabolism, is almost like how a tumor might act. Remember the tumor going into what? Rampant aerobic glycolysis, right? Taking up a whole lot of glucose, taking up a whole lot of amino acids after proteolytic degradation. Of proteins, let's say, in the skeletal muscle, um, you know, inducing that whole process of um, cachexia, right? Wasting of the body, wasting of all the important uh, cellular proteins that allow for normal homeostasis within the skeletal skeletal protein mass, for example. Also, from the adipose, all the lipid can be uh, reprogrammed into utilization for other cellular systems and other cellular beds during an oncogenic event. Well, look at here how the T cell, when it wants to switch to being really super efficient, it just wants to take a glucose. It doesn't have to go through any of that complex lipophilic interaction with fatty acids and triacylglycerol, which require lipase activity to require carrier proteins and binding proteins, right? I'm a lipid biochemist. I absolutely think lipids are the most important biomolecule uh, on Earth uh, and probably even just natural lipids that are not in living systems are also the absolute coolest molecules there are because of all the beautiful things they can do, not just bioenergetics, signaling, and they make the membranes. 
that membranes there is what? There is zero life. The membrane of life. Nucleic acid, RNA, DNA, dissolve the DNA later, ah, you know, but you need that membrane, otherwise you have no cellular life. Always remember that. Those are lipids that cause that. Okay, back to this. Um, glycolysis produces several metabolites that can be used for biostatic purposes. I mentioned this last time. Not only is the glycolytic pathway really efficient, you just take glucose, you, and you don't make very much ATP, but you can make it very quickly, right? Two substrate level phosphorylation systems in the glycolytic pathway. And ultimately makes some NADH, that much of which can ultimately, yeah, uh, via the um, glycerol 3 phosphate uh, shuttle, that NADH reducing power can make it into the mitochondrion at the glycerol 3 phosphate level. And even you can get the NADH if you use the aspartate shuttle, which usually isn't uh, functioning all that rapidly in the T cell, but I don't think that's been looked at as intensely as it could be. An interrupted TCA cycle leads to acetyl CoA. Because you got NADH, you're making it all cytoplasmically. Acetyl-CoA is with fatty acid and growth promoting mevalonic acid pathway metabolites. Okay? A diverse class of sterile and non sterile isoprenoid products start to be synthesized in the T cell because of this riveted alteration of metabolism as triggered by the early phenomenon of activation. It turns out, MBA metabolites regulate T cells at many different levels, both as cell intrinsic and extrinsic metabolic cues. Now, you might ask yourself, why would the MBA pathway work? Remember, the ultimate product of the MBA pathway is cholesterol, which is an important membrane lipid, yes. So normally, if you're considering cell division, you allow cholesterol. Remember, cholesterol is many intermediates in the pathway that build up as... Um, Alter, alterating species of covalent modifiers, which will, can, you, can be utilized to covalently modify growth factors and receptors in membranes to trigger a full-blown activation system, or maybe autophagy, or maybe apoptosis, depending on the rest of the co-stimulatory phenomenon. Right? And all these are going to be lipids. And all of that covalent modification of proteins is going to be really important for tethering proteins into the membrane where they can be involved in the very subtle, complex repertoire of signal transduction from outside to inside and back again. Now, lipid metabolism, not just the prenal lipids, the fatty, fatty acids also get utilized for a similar feature there. Not for bioenergetics, but for signaling. Okay? So that's really key. So quiescent T cells like other non-proliferating cells in the body, display relatively low levels of glycolytic activity. They fully oxidize glucose derived pyruvate all the way through the TCA cycle, right? Make acetyl-CoA via decarboxylation, pyruvic dehydrogenase, or they make oxaloacetic acid, acid via pyruvate carboxylase, right? OAA plus acetyl-CoA in the mitochondria make up course citrate, and that's the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle. So you get it. You make NADH, those dehydrogenases in that pathway, and that gets those NADH and FADH2 if it's uh, at the level of succinate oxidation, will then give you what the oxidized forms of those nucleotides, but also be pumping electrons and protons through the inner mitochondrial membrane, ultimately giving you a light. Okay. Now, this process drives oxphos and maximizes the amount of ATP that I just explained to you. <laughs> in contrast, Activated T cells have a substantially increased demand for metabolic resources because they must perform a factor function. That means they have to go after whatever it is, say a foreign invading organism, and they have to recognize, go get there, translocate there in the blood, uh, recognize that's where it is via concentration gradients and other signaling factors like chemokines, right? ultimately land where they're supposed to, and then outright kill the cells that could be already corrupted, uh, or orchestrate a phenomenon associated with B cells to make antibodies, so that they find in all of the rest of the periphery of the body where that antigen or where that antigen-producing um, organism might be, be it a parasite or be it a bacteria, or if it's just simply a pathogen that is not an organism like a virus. It's kind of a dumb uh, system. The viruses are very dumb. They're not really living because they don't live on their own. And I won't get into that right now. 
All right. Activate T cells substantially increase the demand for metabolic resources because they must perform those functions of accumulating biomass for cell growth and daughter cell generation have to divide. Proliferate. T cell proliferation. I'm sure you've heard of this. Right. Upon TCR stimulation, the T cell receptor, which is a result of its own recombination, beta oxidation becomes tanked. You shut down the beloved fatty acid oxidation system. And this has to do with transcription factors, right? Which are tuning down the expression of those proteins in beta oxidation. And also in the carnitine palmitoyl transfer system. And lipases, that sort of activity. Right? Um, the amount of glucose, however, in amino acid transporters are increasing the T-cell surface. And that facilitates the uptake. So that now the T-cells are not interested in carrying out a slow metabolism, slow and steady state, maintaining a healthy repertoire of what they can turn into, they're poised to turn into. Now the T cell is going to be triggered. Once it's triggered, it's not poised any longer. Now it is an agent. It's an agent of the immune response. It's going to go do its work. So it's going to do its work. It needs to be able to quickly assimilate uh, carbon sources from uh, the bloodstream, like glucose, like amino acids, and then use that as a bioenergetics. At the same time, it's not ceasing lipid metabolism. Of course not. No cell can. It's using the metabolism. It's regearing and utilizing it differently. It's taking fatty acids and modifying proteins so they can target the membrane. And it's taking intermediates in the cholesterolgenic mevalonic acid pathway, isoprenoid pathway, to covalently modify proteins via farnesyl groups or gerinyl groups, like I talked about before, at C15, C20, respectively, of these isoprene units, right? Um, so that those proteins get embedded in the membrane and they function correctly. And sometimes they're associated with membrane rafts, which includes ceramide, includes actually cholesterol itself, the end product of that pathway. Except the final end product, because you know it's like steroid hormone. You get the idea. The transcription factors CMIC and estrogen related receptor A are increased in abundance during TCR mediated activation. That's right, estrogen related receptor A. And they control metabolic reprogramming in the T cell. Although activated T cells will engage some oxphos, glycolysis becomes the prevailing pathway, even in the presence of molecular oxygen. Okay? So we've heard of this before, right? The Varberg effect we talk about in tumors, right? We don't call it the Varberg when this is happening in T cell. Because the Varberg is strictly a discussion of glycolysis over fatty acid metabolism in cells that are quite aerobic and could be easily getting along with fatty acid oxidation and nevertheless switch to glucose. But that shows you that tumor cells, you see, they're highly active cells, right? They're cells that they're not out to kill um, foreign uh, agents. They're out to just take over the landscape, right? So it's still a war being conducted. And when the war comes on, apparently the most efficient um, carbon source for producing ATP as the energy source is going to be circulating glucose. And then abundant amount of amino acids are going to be um, generated in both and also put in circulation uh, after limited proteolysis, for example, in skeletal muscle. Now you might say, well, why amino acid glucose? Because they're water soluble. So any lipid, as excellent as lipids are for so many uses in the cell, they're not aqueous soluble. So that means they have to bind to proteins all the time, or they have to be bound up to something that makes them semi-miscible in a semi-aqueous system. Whereas water-soluble compounds, their only um, barrier to being utilized is to slip through the membrane. And we have all kinds of, as you know, transporters that are quite efficient. That's what's turned on here. Receptors. Uh, receptor transporters that allow for what? The receptor So, although activated T cells still engage in oxygen, by calcium because of the prevailing pathway, as I said, even the presence of molecular oxygen, yeah, 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 therefore referred to as aerobic glycolysis. It has long been thought that the metabolic demands of T cell proliferation forced the switch from oxygen to this aerobic glycolysis. And that's really critical to get. And that, that's what I want you to understand. We were talking there just 20 minutes, half an hour ago, about all this wonderful 
elaboration about T cells are converted and how they differentiate. That's a very important understanding of immunology you need to learn to get any handle on what T cells are doing. But just as important, you have to understand what the activation happens to the T cells internally in terms of metabolism. It's just as critical because any of these systems, if they're not functioning at par or they're over functioning, so you have a hyper response, can either uh, generate an immune system which is weak and insignificant and impotent and therefore not able to conduct what's supposed to, which is kill the foreign system or kill the foreign system that's generated inside its own cell systems um, via, via the whole complex I just told you about, like proliferation of too many proteins in the cell because of a mutation or because of aging, such as the senescent secretory phenotype I was alluding to a couple of lectures ago. Remember that the aging process? Don't worry, this is all part of aging. We're getting there. You just need to understand the immune system. Now. Okay, so um, enough epi lecture. Let's go back to the lecture. In proliferating cells, glycolysis derived pyruvate can enter the TCA cycle and citrate is exported from the mitochondria into the cytosol. So now notice TCA cycles are functioning normally. You're not running through and making any DH there. You're sending the citrate back out. That's because there's plenty of NADH, so the system, the dehydrogenases aren't poised to make NADH for energy consumption because remember all the enzymes that are going to be utilizing NADH in the mitochondria have not been expressed. You've ceased the expression or you've greatly tuned down the expression of all of those genes. The electron transport chain and ox oxidative phosphorylation as well as the utilization of fatty acids and the total utilization of mitochondrial uh, via the dehydrogenase is TCA cycle. So in this manner, acetylcholine is increasingly made available. Increasingly made available not only for fatty acid biosynthesis, but also for the MVA pathway. The direction and diversion of citrate for biosynthetic purposes bears a risk of collapsing the TCA cycle because you're moving citrate out. TCA cycle can't move on, citrate's leaving. And that's because, remember, you have monocarboxylic acid transporters. When you ship out citrate, you can bring in melee, right? And you can get melee via, um, mo via utilization of oxalacetic acid from the pyruvate carboxylase system, right? So this is a really efficient way to trigger the cells to bring in some melee to carry out the last phases of the TCA cycle, but at the same time, not use all the intermediate dehydrogenases. Only the millet dehydrogenase and the isoform and the cytosols are actually functioning. Just like with tumor cells. It's just also, it's complex, but it's also perfectly understandable. This is though why a lot of pharmaceuticals have off-label issues. That is, they have side effects, right? Uh, because, <laughs> While you might be killing a tumor, you may be activating or deactivating something else. In this instance here, if you're killing a tumor, you may also be destroying the T-cell response. And you need an active T-cell population to kill tumor cells, particularly when you start to metastasize. This is why a lot of the conventional drugs that would go after that highly anabolic system, like going, going after mTOR pathway, AKT pathway, uh, phosphatidylinositol went through kinase pathway. All of those systems, you go up to those with a uh, actively growing tumor, you're also going to destroy what's going on in both the innate immune response and then indirectly what kind of T-cell response you get, which could also be a hyperactivation. Hyperimmune response is just as deadly as a hypoimmune response. Please remember that. All right. To avoid that collapsing of TCA cycle, Activated T cells increasingly use glutamine oxidation and glycolysis. Now, this is an excellent um, introduction of how you must understand how amino acids are used. If you can uh, generate the alpha keto acid, alpha ketoglutarate, and send that in via those monocarboxylic acid uh, transporter systems in mitochondria, you can add enough alpha ketoglutarate to keep the TCA study, uh, system. Uh, uh, cycle functioning, but just not at the roaring rate for it being utilized on the front of DH and FDH. 
efficiency. Therefore, what it's really doing, it is a system generating citrate in the cytosol. But in order to generate citrate, you need to be able to constantly flux it through. You have plenty of pyruvate pumping in acetyl-CoA, but some of the carbon has to come from the turning of the pathway through malate and then OAA. Because the OAA has to be abundant enough to make the condensation of acetyl-CoA to make citrate. So all very perfectly coherently logical the way molecular metabolism functions. What you need to know is everything about it. And the way you know everything about it is by listening to what kind of All right. So glutaminolysis, that means to break down glutamine, represents a metabolic shunt that converts glutamine into alpha KG, alpha glutarate, TCA cyclone media, for subsequent introduction into that cycle. Now, in addition, this is what this is what the beauty is of the T cell repertoire. Reductive alpha ketoglutarate, the reverse of what occurs in the TCA cycle can happen with a subsequent synthesis of citrate and then acetyl-CoA in the cytoplasm of the activated T cell. So you're getting some of the glutamine after it's converted to glutamate and alpha KG is made, of course. Um, keeping the cycle going, as I said, you have to keep some TCA cycle going. Just, nothing is ever completely shut off, except when the cell is dead or terminally differentiated. And that's a rare event. Um, I mean, death is rare, but the terminal differentiation and then subsequent utilization, that's not rare either, but reaching a point where there is no TCA cycle and there's no metabolic flux, I can't think of any cells that would last that way at all. They end up going into um, senescence pretty quickly or in the process pretty quickly. That's what they're at in terms of their metabolic regulation. So anyways, you got this um, reverse of the TCA cycle. You're making citrate, you're making acetyl-CoA and the cytoplasm. This is making sure there's plenty of, T of MBA pathway intermediates, the geronyl phosphate and the pyrophosphate, pyrophosphate, those systems. Wholly important, not only, not only for farnesylation and geronyl geronylation of proteins that are going to be working at the surface of the T cell to conduct the business of secretory pathways and signal transduction internally, as we've been talking about. But also what? What's the key feature of that whole system? You need to be able to translocate proteins out of the T cell. What kind of proteins? Cytokines. And are cytokines glycosylated proteins? Yes. And where are they glycosylated? In the endoplasmic reticulum. And the endoplasmic reticulum, when it is dolichol phosphate pathway, when it generates the glycan tree for the proteins that get secreted via the ER, cis trans Golgi apparatus of the plasma membrane, and then out into um, the bloodstream, those kinds of cytokines, pro inflammatory, let's talk about those first, they need to be glycosylated. That entire glycosylation pathway I just told you about using nucleotide sugars does recall, require dolichol pyrophosphate. Dolichol is an intermediate cholesterol. Part of the MBA pathway. You see how it all comes together. Sure you do. Okay. Anyway, yeah, so you make a lot of mevalonic acid in the cytosol, but that's of course going to the HMG core reductase pathway, HMG core synthesis, HMG core reductase pathway for the mevalonic acid pathway, whereas for fatty acid synthesis, acetyl CoA, mal CoA, and then the reactions for fatty acid synthesis make the palmitate. Palmitate then being utilized for palmitylation reactions, either with ribosomes the ribosomal machinery or for um, triggering proteins and um, sequestering them, tethering them to the membrane. So you can get um, carboxy um, prenylation uh, and you can also get uh, acylation as serine residues, threonine residues, and tyrosine residues. All right. So you get the idea how this is all converted into a system that uh, facilitates the T cell to carry out its activating function. Okay. And I'll leave you with this last slide here. It comes off this 2015 paper. That's why I like this paper. So you got to think of glucose. Glucose gets converted to the glycolytic pathway down to pyruvate. You make some lactic acid okay, via lactic dehydrogenase. Pyruvate makes it in the mitochondria, makes acetyl-CoA. Citrate 
citrate leaves the cell because you're pumping in alpha ketoglutarate. So this is blocking <laughs> by the conversion of citrate to alpha KG because there's plenty of alpha KG around. This also helps to keep the NADH to NAD ratio high so you don't get a huge cycling through the TCA cycle. Otherwise, you'd be making way too much reducing equivalents, which you don't use in these cells because you're using glucose and glutamine to make uh, of course. So um, this pathway has to functionally resynthesize OAA because the pyruvate carboxylase reaction, which normally would make OAA in a cell that's act actively going through TCA ox phos, that gene is not expressed very well either in T cells. After you switch the transcription factor, you see, it's all so absolutely uh, logical. So you see glutamine taken up, right? So just glutaminolysis to make glutamate, the alpha ketoglutarate. Some of the alpha KG goes in to keep this system working, to make some OAA, to make the condensation, to make the citrate. But you also make citrate directly in the cytoplasm via this reductive carboxylation of alpha. This is the carboxylation. It's going to use biotin. Uh, biological uh, carboxylation gene biotin. You make citrate, and then citrate, of course, is cleaved through the ATP citrate lyase, uh, a unique form of it. Uh, it makes acetylcholine and fatty acids and the mevalonic acid pathway is pharmaceutical pyrophosphate. You can make some cholesterol. You do need some of that, and you can make isoprenoids. And as I said, you can make dolichol, which is one of those isoprenoids. You can do all that like causation of proteins, such as those that are going to become cytokines is secreted by this T-cell. Right. Okay, so let's stave off this discussion right now. And um, hopefully I've left you with um, a pretty clear understanding of where we're going to be going with this lecture. So I'm going to stop here because I've been talking for a while. I'm going to go over to the clock. I don't know how long I've been talking, probably 45 minutes or an hour. But I want to make sure that you got an idea about how T cells are functioning just at the very basal level. Something about the, the ability to differentiate we talked about, how transcription factors regulate that differentiation, how the level of transcription factor uh, expression is controlled by epigenetic phenomena. I just showed you, you know, the basic methylation pattern of histone lysine. There's also acetylation, and there's also deacetylation, just like the demethylation and methylation. And there's also what? MicroRNA-mediated control over the T-cell system. We're going to talk about that later, too. So there's microRNA involved in the level of um, RNA um, translatability, right? Whether or not the RNA is translated, that's another function necessary to maintain this complex and complicated T cell repertoire during the induction of the acquired immune response when you're turning on T lymphocytes for invading microorganisms like bacteria, uh, fungi, or parasites, or when you have an oncogenic event, or when you also sometimes have a viral infection. Okay, and well, don't worry, we're going to elaborate on particularly the viral and the bacterial. That's in great length. It's really good to compare and contrast. But... Okay, so um, that's where we're going to end it. For now, um, and we're going to get back to you um, with this probably two or three more lectures. I'm going to try to do more video because some people apparently like them. I do like video because it makes me feel like I'm actually talking to somebody. When I do audio, I'm just talking to the microphone. When I do video, I can feel like somebody's actually looking back, which is kind of silly because it's all recorded. Anyways, this is Dr. Daniel John Brown saying. Bye.